Welcome back, everybody, to the A Little Less Fear podcast. I'm your host of the show, Dr. Lino Martinez, and today I'm super duper excited to introduce Paul Zolman. Paul Zolman is the international best selling author of The Role of Love, but the true author of love is God. In his wisdom, he placed us in a variety of circumstances that require us to find our way back to his pure love. So what qualifies Paul to speak about love? His childhood experience of the opposite of love. From that austere beginning and the distaste it informed inside him, he searched for and eventually created a method that transformed his life from anger to loving everyone. I love this topic. Welcome, Paul, to the A Little Less Fear podcast. Thank you, Dr. Martinez. Great introduction. I appreciate that. And I'm happy to be with you on this podcast. Well, it's your introduction. And this is this is your story. And this is why we're, I'm excited to get going here, because your topic here is one of my favorite topics, which is love. And so I'm curious, what brought you to the current journey that you're at right now, where you are at today? What brought you to the, your, your current passion? I grew up in, in very adverse circumstances. And I think that it really was something that all my parents knew. And that's kind of what every one of us have is what our parents do. We're taught that every every single day that we're a child in that home. We're taught what, what our parents knew or what they were taught from their own parents. Right. At age 17 or 18, every child makes that declaration. I'm never going to do that like my parents did it. True. <laughs> and they're going out on their own and they're going to make, make up their mark and they're going to go and do that. I, I was very similar. I left home at age 17 because of that and, and was right after my junior year of high school. I actually moved in with my brother and he had two small children. I'm number 10 of 11 children, Dr. Martinez. And, and wow. it, it, as that uh, child, it was just, uh, you know, it was just, I, I didn't have a lot to say, but I didn't have any younger siblings. My uh, closest my younger sister actually is only a year year younger than I am. So I didn't have the babies to play with or didn't have the younger children. So I really enjoyed being with my brother at the time. And I watched him as a great father. He really did do what he said at age 17 or 18, that he was going to be a better father than than our own father. But but he still had this problem. He He had the problem that my father had, and I saw that he would be annoyed annoyed, 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 stacking these annoyances until the, the straw that broke the camel's back had that flash of anger. And it would happen at just innocuous times. It would just just happen. It would be almost like a knee-jerk reaction that would happen when he got to the top of of, of that, uh, uh, that stepladder that he was climbing up to get those annoyances when they got up to that certain level, it would just flash. And so I realized that, that as I started having children, having my own family too, I had the same issue. And it was generational. It's something that was passed on from generation to generation that in crisis, we would make decisions, sometimes ma major decisions that weren't the best decisions. I think it started with my grandfather or even before that, I had a grandfather that uh, had nine children. This was late 1800s, early 1900s, that had nine children, then his wife suddenly passed away after that ninth child, could have been part of childbirth, or just was something that she passed away shortly after that last child was born. He made a decision at the time to sell the farm, sell all the equipment, and then when people came to pick up the equipment, he would say something like, and would you like this child? And would you like this child? And would you like this child? until he systematically gave away all the children except for one. And that wow. one, one child was Benjamin. He took with, with him from Indiana to Montana, found eastern Montana, found a, a school teacher that had never been married, had 10 more children, of which my father was number six of that second 10. Incredible. 19 children. When my father is 10 years old, this grandfather passed away. So now you have... Com some really complex issues. You've got 19 abandoned children. My goodness. And now my father was born in 1922. So 10 years old is 1932. It's in the middle of the Great Depression. So you've got economic issues as well. My father being 10 years old, he couldn't work yet. So he kept going to school, but he didn't last very long. Only went through eighth grade. Never had any more schooling at all. 
So education is a, is a huge part of, of progressing in any way, but he just never never went back to school. With that eighth grade education, he learned mechanics, learned how to be a decent mechanic, and eventually a truck driver. He was gone through the week and back home on Fridays. One thing I love about my father, Dr. Martinez, is that <clears throat> he always dated my mother every single Friday. I can't keep up that pace myself. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how he did it. It was just it was magical, but it showed me the great value he had on women. And all my older older siblings, except for one, is is a boy. So I'm I'm sandwiched between two girls, one on the older side, one on the younger side. I'm the thorn between two roses. And that that really kind of made me stick out a little bit because what would happen on that date? It was my father wasn't very creative. It was always at the Maverick Bar, always with alcohol. And I can imagine, I was never there, but I can imagine my mother saying, well, how was your week? How was your week? And and they just start telling how their weeks were. And I would, can imagine my mother starting at the oldest child and going down, 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 down all the time until they get down to number 10. But my father is getting annoyed, 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 annoyed by all, all the things that were happening to older children. They're like puppies, Dr. Martinez. Yeah. They roll around and they wrestle and they, they so, somet- sometimes. Sometimes so you imagine that at the time when your mother and your father would get together for date night, that your mother would um, release her stresses on him with each right. kid. Okay, I yeah. get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, and, and everything that happened during the week. So while the, while it's happening and, and, you know, they're, rolling around, somebody breaks an arm or somebody. One one time I had one brother that rode a motorcycle through the chain in the parking lot behind our house. And it just, it scarred him up quite a bit. It was a motorcycle accident right in our backyard. And a lot of medical problems in that way, a lot of extra expense. Those are definitely annoying to a, a provider. That oh no more more bills I hate that yeah, right and, right and I've been there done that and I understand where he was coming from but all those annoyances I felt like when he got to number ten that you know that that was that was it and you were the tenth I'm number ten and so so I I felt like I I was the target just because of the pecking order I was either get the belt or I get a severe spanking. One time I had the uh, severe spanking so bad that it was it lasted the I had I was black and blue for more than three weeks oh and goodness. so it was just it was just really rough rough it was uh, a lot of verbal abuse physical abuse sexual abuse uh, emotional abuse social abuse there was all these kinds of abuses that were being passed on now to eleven children I imagine it was passed on to him from from his family. Sure. Uh, dynamics as well so that's kind of where i came from didn't want to be there i didn't want that angry culture in my life and and the angry culture to me looked like people talking over one another just as number 10 i i didn't have any voice hardly any voice at all everybody's older everybody's wiser my father used to say it like this oh you're still wet behind the ears and it's just like like i just barely came out of the womb i had no nothing and it's just just that t- type of comments. I remember him, one time he he was um, playing with my oldest son, and he threw him up in the air and was catching him, just throwing him up in the air. And he, he was just having a good time with him, but but or he'd hold him up in the air and then he'd say, "You're no good," and it, that was just kind of his way of playing with them. And and just but that was the the flavor of the anger. It just has that culture. That you don't know how to get out of it, and I imagine he did not know how to get out of it either. Right? Yeah. So that that's kind of where where it went. But I didn't want that. Did not want it in my family. And as much as I would say it, it came out negative. I said I yeah. don't want to be angry. And so when it comes out negative, it doesn't manifest in a positive form. It still manifests negative. Sure. And so 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 I realized that uh, you know in math you can multiply two negative numbers and they become a positive right it wasn't working for me yeah in, in this relationship stuff so that's that's kind of the backstory I'm curious so you had a sister below you correct yes do you remember if she had the similar experiences that you did being down at the bottom line of all the kids 
I don't, did she get treated differently because she because of her gender? Absolutely. Uh, that uh, um, my father valued women. Uh, my older sister actually had had a nickname, and um, that was very kind of endearing. I'm not going to even tell you because she'd be really mad at me if I did on pub- <laughs> on this public uh, format. But uh, my my younger sister had a more derogatory nickname, and so there was there was problems with her, and and the older brothers picked on the youngest. The youngest always gets that, and I was the youngest boy, so I got it as from the in the boy format. She got it in the girl format for being the youngest that way. Did you feel protective over your sisters being in the middle? I did. Both? I played with them a lot, and and I I really have a softness toward women more more than I think my brothers do in that way that I, I just I feel like I have a better understanding in that way. And even going through it's a great question, Dr. Martinez. And, and even going through high school, I, I just felt like I had a, a closer affinity toward toward uh, the personality of women and and just getting to know the girls in my high school classes and and just just having a, a, a great uh, uh, great conversation or just a, a great date or whatever it was. I just had a good time with the, with the girls that I went to high school with. So coming from a family of, be, of 11 children and you being the 10th in between two girls, two females, do you feel that having that experience, that lived experience helped you become more compassionate, empathetic, leaning more towards the soft heart that you've acquired now? I think that it really contributed to that, but but in the anger culture, I would think that I really, if someone else looking in was looking at what I was doing, they might not think it soft hearted, because it, it be, but it may have been soft hearted for that angry culture, and I really felt like there was something better. There always is something better, and I always felt that way. That there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way to manage relationships there's got to be a better way to discipline there's got to be a better way to communicate always felt that way and so you found through life you found a way to transform this ancestral anger into love it came about 15 years ago i was actually uh, you know all this anger and and um 23 years and 23 and a half years of marriage really was contributory to the demise of my first marriage and so I, I was single, and so I was dating about um, 15 years ago. And while I'm dating, I found my my sister, older sister, introduced me to a, a woman that I, I found and got serious with. Took this woman up to visit with my brother, number 10 of 11. You always have to be a big sister, big brother approval. Uh, <laughs> you know, in the, in the day, Dr. Martinez, I was the human remote control. My legs were shorter. I could run to the TV. I had to walk up to the TV and turn, oh, yeah. turn the knob to change the channel on TV. I was a human remote control. Oh, my goodness. Well, I had to do what older brother, older sister said. So I always had that, uh, that uh, 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 felt like I needed that older brother approval and, and that validation from them for everything. This wasn't any different. And so... So I took this woman up to my brother, 300 miles north of where I live, and and first thing that happened as I'm bringing her in the house, my sister-in-law pulls her aside and said, the only emotion that the Zolman family learned growing up is anger. At first I didn't, I said, "Uh uh-uh, then it made me mad. Yeah, you responded with anger. (laughs) Exactly, and so I validated exactly what she says, and I realized that at that moment, I had a choice. I can change that that uh, perception of the Zolman family right here and now, change it forever or change it for me. And I realized that I I needed to do that. For me to even progress, for any outsiders looking in, if they're looking at us as an angry family, we're still in that angry culture. I had to find a different culture. I had to really kind of divorce, so to speak, that culture and find something that would work better for me and any of my children Hopefully they would come along and do that. And I think that they've done that for themselves. I know that they've made that vow at age 17 or 18 that they're going to be a lot better than their father. Thankfully, they have been. They're, they're doing they're doing great. Um, and I have eight children. So from my grandfather at 19, my father that had 11, I have eight. My children are only having 
three children, Dr. Martinez. I don't <laughs> get this. Maybe, maybe, Dr. Martinez, you can help me understand why I can have more grandchildren. I want more <laughs> grandchildren. Figure that out. So anyway, I, I started reading the color code and started reading the five love languages. So I really like the principles of the five love languages, but from where I came from, it didn't resonate with me. You mean, you mean, Dr. Chapman, that if I guess what Dr. Martinez's love language is and I cater to that, you're calling that love? Seriously? That's more like a manipulation. I did not get it, and I really didn't. I'm a bad guesser. What's working for me? Mm. And and the second uh, suggestion that Dr. Chapman has, well, if you take this love language survey, you can find out what your love language is. Yes. What the heck am I supposed to do with that? Advertise? I, I was thinking <laughs> about printing some buttons so I could wear it around and say, hello, I'm Gifts. What do you have for me today? Yeah. <laughs> so awkward. I'm done with awkward. I didn't want to do that either. And it was that wasn't working at, at all. You know, if if I told someone what their love language is and or someone told me what their love language is and I tried to cater to that, what if I forgot and they get into this little pity party, unintended, yes, unintended pity party, said, well, I told you how to love me. How come you're not doing that? And they get that whiny voice. I did not even want to go there. So I had an idea. I thought, you know what? As dysfunctional as our family was growing up, sometimes we played games. And when we played games, there'd still be the smack talk. There would still be all the put downs, very aggressive competition, all that that's in that angry culture. But it was fun. It was something that, that was fun. What if I made this a game? So I contacted Dr. Chapman and said, are you licensing those little icons, the little pictures that you have for the love languages? And as, after a little while, his attorney wrote me back and said, no, we're not doing that at all right now. And so I had a copyright attorney friend that um, that I knew here in town. So I, I took the idea to him I, and I said, what can I do about that? He said this. He said, theory, like the love language theory, is not copyrightable. Application is. They weren't doing it as a game. So I realized I can make my own icons, make it into a game, get the copyright for it. So that's what I did. So I created a cube that I have right here. It's just like I about, love that. It's about one inch by one inch. And so on the cube right now, for the listeners that aren't seeing it, is a it looks like a waiter holding a platter. That would represent the, the love language of service. These are all pictures, mind you. The next one is two hearts put or two hands put together to create the heart. From that heart, I have a little like a cartoon conversation fly out. So those would be the words of the heart or represent the words. The next one is a hand holding an hourglass. The hourglass obviously represents time. That would be the love language of time. A hand holding a gift represents gifts. And then two hands touching like they're holding hands would be for touch. I love five, love, five love languages, six sides on the cube. I created the sixth side and named it Surprise Me. So, so there's Dr. Martinez, there's just two instructions. You roll the cube every day, whatever it lands on, that's the love language you practice giving away all day that day, all day to everybody. <laughs> and so, beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you. I didn't have a significant other like Dr. Chapman suggests. So well, who in the heck am I going to love? <laughs> and I just realized, oh, I get to love everybody. It was perfect for me. I don't know anybody, Dr. Martinez, that is with their significant other 24-7. So even if I did have a significant other just practicing it with that person, I at home I'd be loving, at work I'd go be mean, go be angry again, come back and try to try to change that, change that hat and try to change that personality. I needed a consistency for that behavior change and that cultural change to happen. I needed a consistent pattern of life. This provided that. I get to love everybody. And it was absolutely perfect for me to make that change. What I realized what was happening in the annoyance, 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 it was always about being annoyed with other people. Yeah. I realized I was rarely annoyed about myself. Well, there was one time I was annoyed, so annoyed with myself that I didn't talk to myself for three days. What do you mean you didn't talk to yourself for three days? It's a joke. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> hey, Paul, I don't know. There's some people that would probably sit yeah, and, do do and really do 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 that? ignore their own needs. Or, I mean, I'm not really sure. How do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> Tell me how you do that, Dr. Murphy. That's, you're, Maybe you're... ignore ignore your own self needs. I guess that would be a, a way, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, you're still talking to yourself. I'm, I'm ignoring that. I'm, I'm, you're, I mean, you're still talking. <laughs> That's a joke, anyway. So, so I just became annoyed with what other people were doing, and I realized that part of that angry culture is there are no boundaries, absolutely no boundaries, and I needed to draw that line that says I'm not responsible for the choices of that person. Neither am I responsible to criticize or to, to measure their progress in whatever they're doing. It's right. their choice. Oh, that was such a burden lifted off me. It was just something, oh, you mean I don't have to worry about that? I can help them. I can offer a suggestion. I can offer advice. But I, unless I get permission, yeah. I can't, can't give that advice. And I realized that has to be hard and fast rule for me to be able to do what I'm doing. When I realized that, then I realized, well, I was focused on their negative parts anyway. Most people I, that I'm talking about were maybe 10, 20% negative, or they had some faults or some misgivings. But 80 to 90% of them are really, really good. Something that they really have great qualities about them. I was missing that whole 80 to 90% of that person. Realized I was focused on their negative parts. When I realized that, and realize what was happening, how I was getting angry, how I was getting annoyed. Yeah. I realized now I've just got to change my focus. Instead of looking this direction, now I've got to look this direction. I've got to, instead of looking right, I've got to look left. And it was a 180 degree turn for me. By rolling the die and, and committing and determining to love the two seconds it took to determine that, to love all day in that genre, now I'm watching for what's right about that person. What can I love about that person? Dr. Martinez, I got so busy doing that, I forgot to be annoyed. I forgot to be upset. I forgot to stack that. And, and it's just changed my life. And so by doing that, the consistency of learning to love everyone, you were then able to silence the anger. Absolutely. Well, the silence itself, it just it died, just went away all by itself. Do you feel that this also elevated your own self-love? Absolutely. And what I found out for rolling the die is and practicing one type of love language um, or one type of love every single day is that it helped me learn that love language, number one. Number two, right. I'm watch watching for people to light up. No longer do you have to, Dr. Martinez, say, excuse me. Can we pause this relationship for a moment while I have you take this survey so I know how to love you? <laughs> so I can learn your love language, yeah. So awkward. Watch. Just observe. Just watch what they're doing. And when they light up, you've discovered a primary or a secondary love language for that person. Mm -hmm. Make a mental note for that person and wash, rinse, repeat. Do it over and over again. But you'll find that four or five or maybe six or maybe a half a dozen, or six or, or eight times a day that you'll light people up. When you make their day like that, it actually is a great satisfaction for you. Oh, and yeah. I feel there's a there's a great, uh, that satisfaction comes in the form of love. I love that I'm doing this. I love how that fills my my well of love as well by sending it out without any expectation of it coming right. back and and then watching the results of doing that you just trust in the laws of the universe that were that were in place before you or or I were born the law of the harvest karma the law of attraction whatever you want to call it those laws were in place and they're universal laws they were in place before we ever came on this earth trust that those laws are going to bring it back what you send out is going to come back to you Absolutely. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Mm -hmm. And so in this incredible dice that you created, the the six side or the question mark side, what 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 is that question mark side where you could choose what love language you want to use for that day? Great question, Dr. Martinez. I live two, two hours north of Las Vegas. A lot of people around here call it dealer's choice. <laughs> I call it surprise. I call it surprise me. And so it, it really is the the 
side that that day you're watching for opportunities to do random acts of kindness. So it's just it's almost that you're you know all the love languages. Now you're watching for any opportunity to send out love in any way, any way possible. Could be a busy day. Could be a very exciting day to be able to watch for opportunities to send love out. Maybe it's just as simple as opening a door for someone that has packages. In fact, you know, it's funny. I, I go to the post office quite often to send out these packages with the die in the book and, and a journal. And I, I and as I'm doing it, I see someone that's loaded up with packages. And I said, let me get the door for you. The doors are electronic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So, so I stand by the door, so they don't have to, they don't have to stand by the door. But it's just it's just funny. I mean, it's, you can play with it and have fun with it, yeah. but you still can be kind, even at an electronic door. You can still be kind. I'll hold but the you door. know what though, Paul? Even if you say that and the door is electronic, it's and it makes someone laugh. That's love right there, just making someone laugh. <laughs> yeah, it's touching their hearts. So, oh, they're exactly they're, they're trying to be kind. They yeah. can't open the door, but they're doing it for me. <laughs> right, exactly. So for those listening to this podcast episode for the first time and don't know the love languages, the love languages are acts of service, uh, conversation, spending time with someone, giving gifts, touching, and uh, that's it, correct? That's right. Have you found that there's a missing love language? I think that there there is a... There probably is, uh, but but what I found, Dr. Martinez, and I, I'm just going a different direction with this a little bit. I found that 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 stacking effect that I had to get to anger by being annoyed, 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 annoyed. Mm -hmm. That I found that stacking these love languages, stacking kindness upon kindness upon kindness upon kindness, actually gets you to a different level of love. I call it a higher level of love, which would include compassion. Intimacy, mercy, forgiveness, sympathy, empathy, all yes. those all those are higher laws of love. So as far as love languages, there's a lot of them. But right. these these Dr. Chapman nailed it when he said these really are the basic. They are basic. Everybody should know all five love languages. And the reason I say that is because as I'm rolling the die and over a 30 day period, you'll practice have practiced giving away all five love languages. By doing that, you know them backwards and forwards. The best part about that is that it gives you that peripheral vision you never had before. Sure. Dr. Ch Dr. Chapman nails it. He says that most people will give away their primary love language to somebody else in hopes that it comes back to them. True. That's uh, reciprocity, and a res reciprocity in that way is a transaction. This isn't a reality show. This isn't let's make a deal. That's not love. You send out love without any regard of it ever coming back and, and trust that it will come back. The best way to do this is learn all five love languages. You say, oh, they're loving on me. It's not my primary love language, but I can respond to that. I can tell you that I have missed hundreds of opportunities, not even seen it when people have been loving on me. And I said, oh, that's nice. I did, I, and that's it. It never got from nice to love. And it and it I didn't see it as love. Now I have a whole different view of it. This is these basic love languages by learning all of them will improve your communication skills and get you those higher laws of love. And those uh, you could call it higher laws, higher languages of love too. That that honorific part of the language, so to speak. How does it improve your communication skills? Improves your communication skills because. Instead of just seeing one love language, the one you like, you can see all of them. And when there, somebody's loving on you, you can recognize it as love and be able to respond to it. That's I think that's huge. It's very huge. You'll find that uh, many couples, if they don't, if they're not hitting on the love language of their partner, that it's like ships passing in the night. They say, well, you don't love me when they've been sending love. But it's not their love language. They can now you can see it, and that improves the communication. Not only with with individuals, not only with couples, but it would improve it in the, in a workplace, it just or in a school. Any any situation, yeah. any situation like that, improving the, that communication is really going to be 
foundation, though, to building that, getting that stepladder effect up to those higher laws of love. You want to be there. What if somebody is not aware of um, somebody's specific love, the way that somebody expresses their love, uh, regardless of this dice? So let's say that somebody has the dice that you've created and somebody's still not recognizing the love language of their partner and, and they're still in this anger state that you that you used to be in. I mean, what kind of advice can you give someone that's really not feeling the other side of love, regardless of this dice? That's a good question. And and I think that the, the, the probably the best answer is for that person that's still not feeling loved. Um, it, I, I believe love is an active, um, it's an action verb. That if they're sitting, sitting at home, pining away, saying, nobody loves me, and they're just in that little pity party or a depressed state, which happens a lot. Oh, yeah. And they're not doing anything about it, then then the they need to go to the to the Bible and read the, the Last Supper. Read about Jesus says one of you is going to betray me, and each one of the disciples, every single disciple says, "Lord, is it I?" They need to ask that intrinsic question about themselves: Am I the problem in this relationship? And is it? And 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 that really is something that has really benefited me more than anything. Just having that one question, Lord, is it I? Is it me in this relationship that is causing the the distance in the relationship? Sure. Is Am I repelling people? Uh, I mean, it's, it's like that person in the swimming pool that has an accident. You have that have an accident and it repels everybody. Everybody said, runs away and it said, wasn't me, wasn't me, wasn't me. Sure. And poor, that poor person is all by themselves. When you're angry, that's kind of what happens. Is that you rep- repel people, and it's not. And and when you have a pity party or you play the victim, you repel people. And oh, yeah, yeah. And, and so you need to get out of that and just get go down the street. If you're feeling blue like that, go down the street, walk down the street, find something that uh, somebody that feels worse than you do, yeah. lift that, lift them up. When you lift them up, they're going to be grateful. And you're going to be satisfied that you help have helped somebody that day. You have loved someone that day. Get out of your chair. Go find. Go send it out. And in turn, when you do get out of that pity party and you give someone love, someone that's in a worse place than you are, and you give them some love, you you are automatically getting love back because it takes love to give love. Mm-hmm. It takes love, some form of love for yourself, even if it's a little bit, to give it away. I think it multiplies, Dr. Martinez. I, yeah. And I, I really, I really like the idea of, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the sound of music, but there's a it's a yes. classic. It's absolutely a classic. And you're you're musical. So I thought you okay. might be. But Rolf is the little delivery boy, has his bike, and he's he's parked at the on the lawn of the uh, von Trapp family, and and Maria's on the second floor. He starts singing a song to Maria. And in that song, he says, Love in the heart wasn't put there to stay. Love isn't love till it's given away. Yeah, and that's really how we feel our wells. If right. you want your well filled, it seems counterintuitive, but that's what you have to do. You have to give it away for your well to be filled. That's how it happens. I love it. That's beautiful. Oh man, thank you so much for that. So another question about the dice. So let's say that I roll the dice for today and I get the um, acts of service Mm -hmm. side. And so my love language for the day is going to be acts of service. So wherever I go, whether I'd go to the grocery store or whether I go shopping for shoes, I'm going to be practicing acts of service to others. And and in that, people are going to be feeling the magnification of the love that I'm giving by by simply being an act of service, whether it's opening the door, what else is considered an act of service throughout the day to strangers? To strangers, I, you know, I have neighbors in my neighborhood that when they're out washing their car, say, I got another one over here for you. <laughs> and, and, you know, they, they laugh just like that. But <laughs> they would, people that you, if, they would love their car washed. And so you, if you get a neighbor like that, that says, hey, I got one over here for you. Go ahead and do it. 
you're going to yeah. surprise them and, and you're going to send that love out in that way. People that like service are going to light up when, when something like that happens. You can open doors, you can make a meal, you could you could do uh, you could write somebody a note, just put little stickies. I had a, a neighbor that actually uh, he's just a romantic at heart, and he had all these little little post-it notes that he put one in the car and said, "This seat has missed you for for a long time." <laughs> the seat was lonely for you. Yeah. Everywhere she went, it was in the bathroom. It was in the kitchen. It was it was at the counter. It was on the TV. It was everywhere in the house. He had these little post-it notes that said, I missed you. It was a great service. It could have been words, but it was also a service for her. So it could have, a lot of these love languages are cross-pollinated quite a bit. In fact, one of the love languages that I think is an umbrella for all of them is the love language of gift. You could give somebody a, a hug for a gift. You could give write somebody a note for a gift. You yeah. could spend time with someone for a gift. You could make them dinner for a gift. You could do all those sort of type of things. So as far as service go, making dinner, washing their car, vacuuming the floor, taking out the trash, helping with the laundry, any of those things would be service. That's wonderful. That's beautiful. Oh, my goodness. I'd like to get some of your dye. Where can people get these dyes? I want to get some of these dyes. Yeah, they're easily available. You can go to rolloflove.com. And I did a play on words, Dr. Martinez. R-O-L-L is something outside of you. A lot of people really can't change circumstances outside of it. But they do have control of changing circumstances within. That is their role, R-O-L-E. Role of love, R-O-L-E of love.com. Incredible. So what are mental health professionals saying about this incredible dice of yours? Great question, Dr. Martinez. Actually, it was just last year, uh, probably 18 months ago, that a, a mental health professional uh, that I was showing the die to and saying, is this something that you could use in your practice that would help your patients? Yeah. And he, he says, I had to explain it to him. I had to explain almost like we're talking right now. After I explained it, he says, that's incredible. Except my patients need a manual to go with it because, be, and, and, and after you learn it, it's easy. And obviously my own testing doesn't say what the public's going to do because I created it. I yeah. mean, it's, that's not going to work. That's, that doesn't count as a test. So, so that's why he, he's the one that encouraged me to write the book and his, his actually um, in first uh, in the endorsement that he put in the book is the first endorsement in the book. Of, of that. And, and so mental health professionals really are, are starting to, to realize that this is a better way. It's cleaner. It's more, it's so much more simple that you just love everybody. Quit it with, with just a significant other. That's a part-time job. It do, it with, do it with everybody and get that into your character. Make that your culture that you're going to do love and send out love every single day to everybody. And make that part of your personality, part of your character, part of who you are. And and uh, I think that's blessing lives right now. Oh, it's definitely blessing lives. And you're blessing me by telling me about this. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Send love. Oh, you're welcome. So sending love to everybody. What about using this dice um, in relationships, in personal relationships, in intimate relationships? As I mentioned, I think that this really is stair steps you to that intimacy. It, 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 can you imagine someone insulting, 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 and then asking for forgiveness? And then they're still, they come back and, and you might say, well, you're forgiven this time. And then they go back, insult, 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 insult. And then they ask for it again. It's not going to work so well right. for them. So the way this helps with relationships is, is you're walking around thinking, what kind of thing can I do for this person, especially for significant others, especially for your family, especially for your neighbors and your community. It all, you're, you're living together. You're going to see that person again. It's not like once and done. And, and that's exactly what's happening here is that it, these are long-term relationships. And it could be a much longer term relationship. That's what you're building right now. You're building that foundation so that these relationships will last for a long time. 
It's very interesting that you asked that question, Dr. Martinez, because there's a few in my church congregation that know that I have the die and that I wrote the book. And uh, I was under observation. I did not know people were watching me, but obviously they're watching yeah. me. They're watching what I say. They're watching what I do. Sure. If, if I'm impatient, they'll they'll say, well, that doesn't work for him. Right. And, and so I can't even go there anymore. No, you can't. <laughs> but I made that commitment. I'm not going there anymore. So anyway, I've got my arm around my wife sitting on the pew. And after the service, uh, I get up and start to walk out. And he comes approach me and says, I think I know what you rolled for your dice today. And I said, oh. Uh, and he said, yeah, I saw you with your arm around your wife. I said, come on, bring it in. And his, yeah. his, and, his it. and his name was Bo. And he just starts cracking up, could, was laughing uncontrollably as we're, as we're embracing and just gave him a big hug. And oh, was, that's beautiful, Paul. It was, it was awesome. That's how it is helping relationships for me. It re Oh, my goodness. That's beautiful. And I can also see how this could even help uh, like teenagers and people that have um, a lack of words to express certain affections. I could see how this can actually even motivate a younger population into growing into more of a well-rounded, um, balanced, loving human being, which is what the world is lacking a lot of right now. We need that. We absolutely need that, Dr. Martinez. I am testing this in the, the K through six school system right now. Excellent. So what, but what happens is that they they the class as a class they roll the die the first thing in the morning. The teacher it takes two seconds. So the the, the teacher uh, takes maybe 30, 45 seconds to explain class. This is the type of behavior we're looking for today. That's it. Let, and the class lets the class go. At the end of the day, I, I've talked to teachers worldwide, Dr. Martinez. These every single one, without a doubt says that the last 10 to 15 minutes today is very non-productive time. The kids have been there all day. They're tired. They've just, their brains are mush. They sure. just, they don't, they don't want to do anything. They can't right. learn, can't learn anything. A decompression activity of the best kind is to write in a journal. That's going to take it, take it down, take it down a notch. So I created a journal and I provide these teachers with a PDF of this journal page that says what they rolled, opportunities they saw to love in that way, what they did about those opportunities. Now that child is responsible for their own behavior. It's not the teacher. It's not the principal. True. That child is responsible for their own behavior. It took me, Dr. Martinez, to age 35 to stop blaming my father for these awkward situations, that stacking of annoyance on top of annoyance and having that flash of anger. 35 years old. Yeah. Now the now they can get it at six years old. The second thing that happens with this is I I remember my first grade teacher. I remember her name. So do I. <laughs> so do I. But I don't remember second, third, fourth, or fifth. I do remember oh. sixth. But I remember her name. And it must have really been a, a huge contrast of, of a situation from home to that school. And, and just I loved that first grade teacher. Absolutely loved her. I would have loved to have a love journal. So what this journal does for her, for the student parents, the teacher checks it off that they the student did that, reads, might scan through the story. The next day, if they've got some really good stories, they'll read the story in front of the class. Look what Johnny did. Look what Susie did yesterday. Listen to that. And that's going to motivate those kids to say, well, I'm going to do something like that today. I'm going to do something really spe special. Yeah. So that my, my journal page is going to be read tomorrow. And they're just having a little internal competition there. The second thing that happens, though, is that the teacher checks off that it was done, sends it home with the child. The suit parents will put those in chronological order. At the end of the school year, guess what you've got? You've got a journal, a love journal of that first grader or that third grader or that sixth grader. It's a wonderful thing that you can look back 10 years, 20 years down the line or even when you have your own children or grandchildren, look back on that love journal from first grade or those primary grade grades, and you'll just you'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll have just a wonderful thing that builds a foundation for these kids. It's going to tamp down even the inclination to have any misbehavior or any bullying or anything like that. Just tamp that down and just teach them these basic love languages 
So to improve their communication right out the gate. That's really powerful, Paul. This is really powerful going into the schools and um, basically giving them the abilities to transform their lives through through love. And I can really see this going to the high schools and, and changing since the most angered populations are the t- teenagers. Mm-hmm. That's really where it all begins, their anger issues. So it's really incredible that you're starting with the youngest and that's going to basically go with them and stay with them throughout the rest of their lives. I hope so. I hope so. And just make the world a little bit better place. That's that's all we're here to try to do, Dr. Martinez, just make the world one by one just a little bit better. Well, you are because you're planting these seeds and with the youngest population, and that's the next generation. And the generation after that, you're changing ancestral anger and these patterns that no longer serve humanity. This is really incredible of you, Paul. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Martinez. It really is a joy. It's a, a labor of love. It's and and part of the <laughs> fun. It's, it is really it's fun. It's it's just fun to watch people light up and and fun to just love. I mean, who could have known that loving is so so much fun? And it's really not the romantic love, it's the decency and the kindness yes. to one another. Uh and, and it's just how it comes back. Today. I went, I rode a bicycle. I have an e-bike and I rode it a couple miles away. I was right before a podcast that I was doing earlier this morning. I was going to go get some breakfast at Chick-fil-A. I get there and I, I get in line and I then I tap my pockets. I forgot my wallet. And I just just exclaimed it like that out loud. And there was a just there was one other guy in front of me and another guy waiting for his food. And then I walked out and I said, put my bike helmet back on. And this guy that was waiting for us who came out and says, let me buy you breakfast. And I, I said, really? Oh, that's so nice. And just humanity's out there. The good of people is really out there and it's everywhere. And, and I think people really want that. They want to have these opportunities to send love out in many different ways. You're also getting that back through karma. All that love that you're giving. I mean, that's just the universe. That's God giving it back to you. Every, all the love that you're giving, this breakfast, this offer of let me buy you breakfast, that's because of how much you're already radiating. You're getting it all back. How beautiful is that? Oh, it's fun. It's really fun, Dr. Martinez. And I love that it comes at opportunities and times you yeah. wouldn't ever expect. I was ready to ride my bike back and say, forget it. I can't do it. I don't have any more time to go back and then come back again on my bike. And so, and by allowing somebody to gift you the gift of breakfast, of of a a gift of, of what is that? In that case, it's a it's a it's just a gift. It's a gift of um, is yeah. it a service at that point. It could be a service. It could be a gift. It could be yeah yeah. It's all it's all a gift. Yeah. And by you accepting that gift of breakfast from somebody, you're also allowing them to practice their love language. And in that reciprocation, the both of you are lighting each other up. It's really magical. Could be a random act of kindness as well. Yeah. Oh, I love this. So where can our viewers, our watchers, and our listeners find your dice, find your book, and that journal that you have? So it's all in a bundle. And the bundle is $29.99. And it's actually about 20% off the full retail price of each individual item. It's a whole lot less than just one therapy session. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's at rolloflove.com, R-O-L-E of love.com. At rolloflove.com. And how can our viewers, our watchers, and our listeners find you if they'd like to get a hold of you? They can find me at, uh, there's contact at rolloflove.com. Oh, they great. can find me there. They can leave comments there as well. Um, well, that's probably the best way to find me. Uh, they can also, if, if you've got a lot of audio uh, uh, listeners that are just audio audible type listeners, if they want to listen to the audible of the book, they'll need to go on Amazon. But they don't oh, want to. Excellent. They don't want to search for Roll of Love on Amazon because you're going to get love this, love that, love a million things. It's going to be needle and haystack trying to find that. Sure, type sure. in type in my name, Paul Zolman. It should come right up. Okay. And then there's a Kindle version and the Audible version of the of the book. Excellent. And do you have social media? Social media is um, Roll of Love Dice on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn. Excellent. 
Thank you so much, Paul. It's been a pleasure. It's been an honor. Thank you for your acts of love. It's just um, it's just really magical and it's beautiful. And I'm glad that we can lovingly have this incredible conversation on a little less fear podcast. I wish you and all of your loved ones and your family members an incredible amount of just grace, gratitude, and goodwill for everybody. Thank you so much for sharing your light. Thank you, Dr. Martinez. And thank you for your gift and love and time that you've given me to be on. Oh, I love it. I love this. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Absolutely. Likewise. Thank you.